Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for attending tonight's lecture. My name is Joan Du. I'm the Dean of the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape, and Design. And I want to welcome all of you to the school tonight. First, I would like to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Winda, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Before I introduce tonight's public lecture and our great guest speaker, I would like to take a moment, for us all to take a moment, to consider how celebratory this evening is. There are many reasons to be thankful tonight. I can think of at least three. First, let's take a moment to celebrate our resilience for enduring three long years of isolation and for overcoming the challenges imposed and due to the pandemic. For this main hall to be so full of students, staff, faculty, and guests from across the city, from our various communities, after so many months of silence and emptiness, this is so encouraging and uplifting. And it's just really wonderful to be able to note that with all of you. Secondly, this is a celebratory moment to mark the start of the 2022-2023 academic year. It is the first full week of classes. This year, we are welcoming more than 450 new students to our faculty, which now has become a community of nearly 2,000 students, faculty, and staff across all of our various disciplines and programs. I'm very, very grateful for their presence and for the energy and hopefulness they all bring to our school. Lastly, let's take a moment to mark the first event of our fall 2020 public program series, our Gary Chair Lecture, featuring our fantastic speaker, Marina Tabosam. As an architect, Marina is well known for addressing the needs of many communities, especially those over the past few years was especially threatened by the pandemic. Since 2020, her practice has undertaken various projects dealing with population displacement and humanitarian challenges. And the fact that she has created such beautiful, purposeful work during such challenging times within the complex social and environmental context of Southeast Asia is yet another reason to celebrate. I'm very thankful and happy that she's here with us tonight. The, f the central to Marina's work are a few facts. Marina is based in Dhaka, Bangladesh, where she founded her practice, Marina Tabosam Architects, in 2000. Prior to that, she was a founding partner of another architectural practice that has always embedded its roots and works in the city and in the region. Since then, she has developed an international and regional reputation for her socially and environmentally sensitive, community-minded works, which encompasses everything from mosques, museums, community centers, to various residential projects. One of the common denominators of Marina's work is how hyper-local each project is, embodying principles of sustainability, materiality, and economy in the various processes. As I mentioned, this evening's lecture is the Gary Chair Lecture, and Marina is our 2022 Frank O. Gary International Visiting Chair in Architectural Design. This endowed chair brings a, a group of international architects to Daniel's faculty every year to teach our students and to deliver a public lecture to share with our communities inside the faculty and also outside. 
The program has also produced a network of knowledge and connections that continue to enrich our faculty and beyond. Just one thing to share with all of you and to Marina. This past spring, I was on a thesis review here, I think in this very room, at the faculty, that also included a former Gary chair, the Slovenia-based architect Tina Gregorik. When a thesis student presented a thoughtful project focused on how architectural projects could serve those communities displaced by environmental crisis, both Tina and myself said simultaneously, have you seen the work of Marina? So I look forward to sharing that with Tina that we've been able to bring you here. Tonight, Marina will be speaking about the architectural transition in an unstable world, one faced with no multiple overlapping challenges from climate change to political wars and the mass population displacement resulting from these crises. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Marina to the podium. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Do you want to go and sit there? I don't think you'll be able to see. That's it. true. <laughs> All right. So. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Juan, for your beautiful uh, introduction. Um, I'm absolutely happy and thrilled to be here. And, and you know, it's an honor to, to be in this prestigious institution and to hold this very important chair. Um, and we've just started. It's the beginning of the semester. Um, we've already had a few days with my students, wonderful kids. <laughs> I don't know if they're here today because they told me that they have a class or some course. So they'll see it online. All right. <laughs> OK, so um, my office, Maina Tabas of Architects, it's based in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And um, we've been practicing you know, I, I, since I think I, I graduated in 1995. And then I worked with an architect. But after that, I've started my own practice very early. And so, um, so we've been able to produce some projects and trying to kind of try to restrain in many ways looking into the issues of where I am, where I belong, where I practice. The last few years or let's say last um, you know two years or two, two and a half or this year even, I mean these are two of the major concerns that has been most pressing in our lives. One is the COVID crisis and the other one is the burning world of our uh, climate crisis. So basically, um, this is kind of bringing us to a lot of questions about what went wrong, why this whole thing is happening, why are we facing this? And I suppose it's about time for all of us to sort of um, rethink, reimagine, re and understand, and then to, to, to in many ways, f find ways of remedy and to bring bring about the changes. One major change or one major issue that we have had in the past few decades is the over-extraction, over-production, and the imbalance that was created because of that reason. And um, those who face the challenge is not the ones who, are, who we see in front of us, actually. So I come from Bangladesh. This is Bangladesh's map, as you can see. We are facing sea level rise. And the sea level rise um, is not dissimilar in all the places around the world. Uh, it's particularly quite an important area, which is the Bay of Bengal, which is the southern part of Bangladesh. And it is connected to the Indian Ocean. And the way the current works, uh, because of the temperature rise, the currents are changing. And because of that, we have salinity that's constantly uh, being more and more going into our uh, river system. The ecological balance is being disrupted. A lot of issues are being created. So um, you see a lot of people who are actually facing uh, this, this change and this whole uh, problems who, had, who has actually zero carbon footprint. And so we have, as a society, as a world, an enormous responsibility, I feel, 
not just Bangladeshis, but the entire world has responsibility towards them. And as a profession, our responsibility is even greater because the greenhouse gas emission by our industry is 40% of the entire um, emission that has happened all over the world. So as, a, as an industry, building construction industry, uh, we need to change our ways. So Bangladesh, uh, just to go about, this is Bangladesh. It's placed um, uh, in the foothills of the Himalayas, and there are three major rivers, the Ganges, the, that's coming from the uh, east, western part, then there is the uh, Brahmaputra, and there is another river called Meghna. All these three rivers coming from the Himalayas actually converge and then flushes into the Bay of Bengal. And over the years, accumulation of silt has created this land. So Bangladesh, two thirds of it is delta. It's flat land, all made out of alluvium that was collected from the Himalayas, settling and then creating this land. So if you look at it over there, if you take out the landmass, it's basically more than 700 rivers and different kind of water bodies uh, and uh, ponds and wetlands, that's all it's constructed with. So it's more of a waterscape than a landscape. So when water rises, it really channels into the entire system and creates a, a lot of difficulty. This is a unique delta and the uniqueness of it is that it's constantly changing, shaping and reshaping. The rivers are constantly shaping and reshaping themselves. This is an image of NASA over 20 years time. And within 20 years, you can see how the rivers have moved and shifted and also creating sand beds within the river. So this is a unique delta X system that happens because of the glacial flow from the Himalayas and also the rain. Um, and at the same time, we have a tide dominated delta and because of that reason, there are all these actions that happens. And in the real ground, uh, this is what you see. This is a very fragile soft soil and when there is enormous current coming because of the glacial flow and also because of the rainwater, uh, this soft soil kind of fragile and it erodes the banks and a lot of uh, villages, um, small towns have been washed away uh, by the rivers as they change their courses. And this has escalated because of the sea level and the climate crisis. Um, and it has rendered a lot of people homeless, uh, has a lot of people have lost their home, uh, villages have been completely washed away. Uh, and these people have become uh, internally displaced persons, IDPs as they're called. And the IDP, especially when you're internally displaced, uh, you become invisible to the system. The, there is no policy or right that protects people who are displaced. So do we have any, as, an, as a profession, that's my, that was my question, that do we really have uh, a responsibility towards people like that? Do we build anything for them? And at the same time, if you look into the land, um, the sand beds that I showed you, in our local language, we call them chor. So these sand beds also form in the middle of the river. These are not really land, though you can trade on them, they're not land, they belong to the river. So they accumulate as a sand bed. Quite often, uh, if, it, if it can survive eight years or more, um, it becomes settled land, otherwise it can wash away. So this eight year is an interesting time which really develops a kind of an ecology and uh, lets these people who are landless to come and live there. Because after eight years, uh, when it settles down as a land, then the government comes in and starts to, uh, you know, make all the registered, registering it as a, as a land and also people who uh, live in that area starts to come and claim their own uh, inheritance to these issues. I'm not gonna go into the inheritance because that was a large, uh, uh, um, I would say, a, a, a research that we did for a Sharjah Triennial, but I'm going more towards architecture here. So this is um, one of the uh, house form that you can find, vernacular house form, in this entire area from starting from the Brahmaputra 
all, all the way coming down to the Bay of Bengal, which is a flat pack system. So for more than 200 years, people have been living in these kind of houses. So what happens is when there is a crack in the ground, um, people understand that, that their land will be washed away. So they take the buildings down, knock, it, knock them down, dismantle them, put it in a cart or, or a boat and move it to a safer location. And you can find these kind of houses um, in markets. So there are markets in various locations where they make these houses. These are basically wooden frame structure and they're corrugated metal sheet because it's the easiest uh, to find. So you can, th these are the markets where they actually build these houses. So they are different size, shape, and uh, depending on the cost, you can also um, you know, add to that. If you change the material from corrugated sheet to wood, then you have a much more expensive house. Uh, so it, it depends on however you want to build it, but generally they have a few different uh, modules that they build. And these are two-story houses, single-story houses. And so for this uh, research that we did um, for a, a triennial, which was in Sharjah, uh, we bought three of these houses and we shipped it to UAE in the United Kingdom. And you can see this is one of the houses there. So we bought three of them. And this is the house in their own location, and that's um, in the venue of Sharjah where we were um, given a courtyard where we actually built these houses. And three architects from my office and a carpenter went and basically just assembled them. So, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a kind of a house form, flat pack system, even before IKEA thought about it. We had it for 200 years. And, um, and so, you know, if it can move from one location to another, it can move from one country to another. So that was the idea. And our research on the inheritance of human, uh, I mean, the, the, the next generation, how would they inherit? Uh, that was our, our study. And we basically f showcased the entire study inside the houses. Um, so during the pandemic of 2020, when everything was, um, you know, locked down, um, this research was done in 2019, and uh, office was closed. Uh, all the sites were closed. There was nothing going on. Um, we were all locked in our own houses. We thought that this could be an opportunity to, uh, to focus on this research and to take it further. The idea was always that when we were uh, doing the research, we were going into the lower part of the Ganges Delta, which is in the, uh, in the lower Meghna River, and we've seen and encountered a lot of people who, did, who doesn't have any house to live in. They're living on these sand beds uh, with whatever material they could find from that location and build something. So the idea was, can we create a flat pack system, which is low cost, uh, which is uh, lightweight, uses local material, can be easily assembled and disassembled within a short period of time, and uh, so this is what we came up with. So it's a very basic space frame structure that uses bamboo as a, as a structural material. And then we created some connectors that connects on the corners to give it a sturdy structure. You don't need a lot of foundation for this, just a small foundation is good enough to anchor it to the ground. And then um, we thought of using uh, uh, corrugated sheet as roofing because it's easy to take along uh, instead of thatch. And um, this also allows them two levels. So there's a ground level and a first level. So if there is flooding, they can also move to the upper level and the lower level uh, could be a space which they spend, uh, the day, day activities can be done in the lower level and the upper level could also be a place for sleeping. And this entire structure, according to our construction ideas, was about $200. And, and this is a few of the renderings that we did where we thought that we can create a cluster of houses where people can live. And in case there is flooding, they can move to the upper level. So these are some of the, and then if, if you need to move from the villages to the city, you can also take your structure with you and move it um, to a, a city location where you can, again, bring it up and you know, maybe have a small shop down there and, and live on the upper level. So these are some of the ideas we had. We call this uh, new form that we have come up with um, uh, Kudi Bari. Kudi is a, in Bangla, Kudi means, uh, in English it means small, Bari is a house. So Kudi Bari is the term that we have been using it um, to describe this uh, new form of house that we have come up with. 
And so the first house we built in the in the um, in Dhaka in a small plot, two of these architects that you can see, they together built this house, and we found that to be quite sturdy. Then we decided to take it to the chores um, in the middle of the river. And here you can see that's the location. To, to go there, you have to take a boat like that from Dhaka to the mainland. And from the mainland, you have to take another boat like that to go to a place like that, which is middle of the river, just sand and nothing else. And, and that, that's the kind of sandbars that you find in the middle of the river. And so this is quite often the kind of situation that you see. The river is actually up there. You don't see the river. The river and the, and the sky is kind of blurred together, so it's not seen. So that's the enormous size and the scale of the rivers uh, that Ganges, Ganges has. So, uh, so these are some of the sand beds which have settled down for maybe, this, these are about five to six years of age. Uh, in the middle of the river, and that's why where you see all these landless people uh, living uh, in these areas, quite often uh, doing agriculture and living their lives. Um, so again, you see that's the river over there. You can see a small boat, a red one. That's a ship actually going from the Bay of Bengal to Dhaka. Um, and so, so that's the enormous scale of the river. So the first house that we built is here. The idea was uh, we work with the communities who live there, so um, they also um, take part while we do the construction uh, because you know, when they have to move, they have to move it themselves, so they need to understand the whole construction technique. And uh, for the facades, we use tall grass, which you can find in the location. So these tall grass here that you see in the toilet or even there on the facade are just long grass that you can cut and make a facade with. And that's how they've been building their own houses too. So basically that's what we use. Generally, we only take the bamboo and the steel joints with us because that's the easiest to carry. Uh, it's not so easy to bring material from different locations. It's quite difficult. So sourcing material from location is easier. Um, so we have built several of these kind of houses in this lower part of the Meghna River where these, uh, these places completely gets inundated uh, during the monsoon season. Uh, so it's all, uh, or it can wash away. As far as I know, this entire landmass that you see are not there anymore, it's already washed away. And so, and they have to, they had to move, so they moved away. So this is a two, two module structure uh, where this is a, a bigger family. So this is a scalable also. You can, you can take two modules and make a bigger house if you like, um, and the idea is that we will give them the roofing and the uh, structure, the entire facade, then the locals or the homeowner actually make it by themselves. Um, uh, so that's how it's done. Uh, some of the details, as you can see, as I said, that these are made with tall grass. And the entire project uh, is done by architects and volunteers, students. So they go to the site, especially in this case, there is no running water, no electricity, no toilet facility. They just take their tent, they go there, stay there, uh, and the people who live in these communities actually cook the food and they eat the food and that's where they've been staying and, uh, and uh, building these houses. And then um, after we built this several houses in the lower part of the uh, Bay of Bengal, we got a funding from the Swiss government uh, to build about 100 houses in different locations in Bangladesh as a research to see whether this is something people would be able to adapt. You have to understand that we are trying to make an intervention into the vernacular, which is not the easiest thing to do. People have to accept it. If they don't accept it, then it doesn't work anymore. So that intervention uh, is, a, is a long and slow process. So one of our sites is this area, which is close to the Indian border. The, green, the yellow line over there is the Indian border. So the way the, the border is created between India and Bangladesh is that all the hills belong to India and all the flat land belongs to Bangladesh. So when it rains, the entire rain, and especially you have to understand this is the area which is Meghalaya and Assam, and the highest rainfall in the world is Cherapunji. Cherapunji is right above here. 
So all the water coming from Cherrapunji comes and gets collected in this, in this wetland. And so uh, these are actually basically wetland to collect the water, and the water stays there throughout the season of uh, uh, monsoon. And then slowly we have a dry season when, when there is no rain, and that time it slowly recedes. So during the dry season, uh, this is what you see. So this becomes an absolutely dry land, and where people actually uh, do their agriculture, mostly uh, paddy, uh, rice cultivation. And during the, the, this same area where you can see one of our kudibar is standing, and it's the same area during the monsoon season. The entire space gets completely flooded, and quite often if the rain is too high, the water floods the entire area, and the house would probably be half, half underwater. So this is uh, after the water receded. So we had a big flood uh, this year um, in, uh, in April, after April, I think in May. Uh, and, and all these areas was completely inundated in water. So the way we work is we have these brochures that we make uh, that ex explains how the project goes. And then this is being explained to the people who live there. Uh, to make them understand why this is a better system, why if they take this, they can save themselves when there is a flooding, uh, they, didn't, they, don't, they won't have to move away. And so, uh, so that's a system that where the architects basically engage with the locals. And then we also do a few different kind of activities, like we do uh, mapping of the entire village because they have no map, of course. Uh, so we do the mapping uh, with all the younger generation who comes and tells us what's their, you know, whose house is against whom, and then they, they measure all this. So we make a measured drawing of the entire village, and these villages are long embankments, that's it. So the embankments are used as villages. So that's where you see the map is just like a line, like a rail uh, train or something, and so there's a, uh, so that's one. And then we also make models with, uh, with people so they understand the entire system. We have some exhibitions, and then we have local carpenters who we employ and who understand the whole system. So basically we try to make it as comprehensive as possible so that we can, uh, once we build it, people have the knowledge. So sharing knowledge is important and also the fact that they also need to uh, accept it as their own. And so we've uh, been able to build uh, about 20 houses in this area and then before the flooding and then the flood happened um, these houses survived. Uh, the homeowners were able to save themselves on the upper deck. Also the neighbors who didn't have similar kind of houses were also allowed to come and stay. So this uh, actually proved that uh, they, they can actually work during flooding season. So here this, the house that you see is, is you know, th that's how they protect the uh, edges like an embankment. The same house when the water is up. Uh, so the water gets quite high. And generally people use it the way they um, try to adapt it according to their own, un own need and everything. So that's the room on the lower level. And on the upper level, they generally use it for sleeping. And, and so you know, these are people who have been displaced. They're moving to places where generally people would not live like in these wetlands or even in the sand beds um, because these are not claimed by people. So these are just spaces that they create and they occupy. Um, so these are a project that's going on. We, we are trying out uh, these 100 houses in many other different locations also. I'm just sharing one or two different uh, places with you. The other project that we are do, we've been doing in the last two years is working in the Rohingya refugee camps. And as you know that Rohingya uh, refugees uh, are living in Bangladesh. We have about one million refugees in Bangladesh um, living in the area called Cox's Bazar. So we share a border with Myanmar. And this area, red area, which is the Rakhine state, that's where the Rohingya refugees were staying uh, since 1400s. Uh, but the Myanmar government has not given them the uh, citizenship rights and there were ethnic cleansing and genocide for many times, but this time in 2017 there was an enormous amount of refugees who, who moved because of the genocide and killing uh, to Bangladesh 
And um, we, have, we had about 60,000 at that time, which is now almost 1 million. And, and so um, and this is the scenario, what it looks like, just a very small part where you can see it's a very dense, one of the densest um, refugee camps in the world. And so, uh, so it, we have, a, uh, I think this was also done by UN. So UN has mapped the entire refugee camps and you can see the entire area. The, uh, the thing is, it's a very hilly terrain uh, in that part of Chittagong or the Cox's Bazar. Uh, and that area, uh, we have some of these rivers, but also higher um, hilly uh, areas and then valleys. So depending on the topography, the entire, um, you know, the density is also changing. So this is an entire map of the, of, the, of the people who are living there. So it's about one million. And um, so in 2002, let's say this was, a, as you can see, a very uh, forest land. So this forest was very much affected um, when the refugees came in, the, the exodus of the refugees that had happened at that time. And, um, and so you see here refugees being settled um, and for one million people, there's, it's almost an enormous city and you need all kinds of logistical services that's needed. So the entire forest was cut to make space and that's where you see that they were trying to create retaining walls, but quite often now what happens is when there is rain, a lot of mudslide happens um, and also um, the whole macroclimate because of no presence of any trees is becoming quite difficult. So the Bangladesh government has insisted that there should be plants reforested again. And uh, one of our project was about reforestation. So we worked with the refugees, as you can see here. So we generally, what we do is we have workshops with the refugees trying to make them understand why it's necessary to have plants. And then we try out different kind of uh, natural technique of planting where we have a technique called bamboo nailing. So we take live bamboo and we nail it to the ground, which then during the monsoon season roots and, and creates this uh, uh, very anchored soil. We also have uh, these techniques called mud ball techniques where we make these seed bombs with mud and then we throw it to the locations where it's not possible to grow. And then we also have, so that's the forest, that's what it used to look like. And so that forest um, floor has a lot of information. So we take the forest floor and we try to take that and put it in the places where the entire forest floor has been raptured so that new growth can happen. So it's a kind of a way of co-creating with the nature. Uh, that's what we call that. And at the same time, we have also, um, since we, we are working there for in many, uh, about almost eight projects that we are doing, we're building women-friendly centers, uh, we're building disability center, uh, child-friendly centers. So there are a lot of these projects that are happening. Uh, our client is World Food Program, and we are also building a food distribution outlet for the World Food Program uh, so that people can have dignified way of having food. So again, uh, this entire process, the way it goes is that we have workshop with the local communities. We also have workshop with the refugees where architects and uh, the, the community sit together and they discuss and the entire program is built through communication. So we talk to them and through communication, the entire program gets built. And so one of the Kudibari that you can see here is actually a house that we built for ourselves because we needed to stay somewhere and Cox's Bazaar is about an hour and a half distance from uh, from Ukia where the refugees are living. So it would be a commute every single day. So we decided we should make a house right outside the camp. Uh, so this is a house we built for ourselves in the middle of the forest. We took permission from the government to build a small house for us. And so we used our technique of Kudibari that we have built. So this is a three module Kudibari that we have built for us. And um, it's made out of bamboo. And the reason for bamboo is because in the refugee camps, there is a restriction of materials. You cannot use any material you want. It has to be a temporary material. And quite often the, uh, the brief comes as do not make it attractive. You cannot make anything attractive. And the reason is that, that the refugees should not feel that they belong here. It's not their home. They have to go back. 
And so you cannot do anything that makes them too comfortable to, to want to stay in this location. So that's why bamboo, according to government <laughs> regulations, is not something beautiful. So you can build with bamboo. Uh, so we tried out bamboo for ourselves first. So this is the Kudibari technique. We have three uh, modules here, which we built. And this is where we stay when we go to the site. Uh, we s live on the upper floor. And in the lower floor, we do our works and everything. So you can see our bed up there. And that's where you know, all the architects and everybody sit together and, and do their works. Um, so this is the upper floor. And that's our um, architects, landscape architects, carpenters who work on the site. Um, so we have a, a group of community architects. They call themselves community architects because they work with communities. So these community architects are the ones who actually have the knowledge and the experience of communicating with people. And so they are absolutely vital to this project. Um, so these are some of the images, as you can see, of the refugee camp. And um, so we, this is one of our first workshops where we sit with them. And um, so these are all refugees, as you can see here. And basically working together making models, trying to understand what their needs are, what is it that a women-friendly center should be. So, you know, they have, each family has one room, and in one room there could be nine, ten people living. And so the women do not really get enough space or any kind of privacy as such. So the women have their own need. When they want to come, they say, we, I just want to have a space where I can sleep. Or, um, you know, I could, I, I, can you give us a proper toilet so that I can take a bath? Uh, so, you know, very basic needs that are not being fulfilled. Um, and so, uh, so these are the places. Uh, so they basically work together. They make models, and, and they're absolutely brilliant, talented people. Had they had the chance to become an architect, they probably some of them would have been a really good architects too. But, you know, life has its own way of doing things. So, yeah, so basically that's, um, that's one of the workshops with the refugees. And these are women from the host community. So host community are the Bangladeshis, whose life has been disrupted because of this one million people being here. And so uh, they also have lost their livelihood because they had their own land where they used to um, cultivate and everything. So uh, World Food Program also has a program where they have um, you know, used these women farmers. They give them space where they can cultivate their own um, vegetables and gardens and those, the fresh produce, what they, what they make then goes to the, um, to the refugees uh, and the food distribution outlets. So we've built um, with them um, these aggregation centers. Uh, again, as I said, bamboo is the only material we are allowed to build with. Um, and so we have these uh, steel joints which actually gives it a sturdy structure. We have two levels. The lower level is used for um, as a market, and the upper level is where the women generally come and uh, and 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 you know use it as their own space. So that's the structure, as you can see, and these are some of the houses or the uh, aggregation centers uh, that we have done. Um, the lower level is basically where they actually um, sell their produce. Uh, so people from different places come and and buy these. Um, so these are like hubs where all the women come from different places. So there is a network and cooperative uh, of these women farmers and they come and, and sell their produce right here. And, um, and so this is uh, one of the upper decks. Uh, I see that I have already spent 50 minutes talking about this. <laughs> I don't know what should I do. Um, maybe just to very quickly show you a few of other kind of projects that we do. So, um, you know, Tropic of Cancer cuts through Bangladesh, which makes it a subtropical climate. We have a dry season and a wet season, as I have already mentioned. And our temperature is definitely nothing close to Canada. We are very fortunate to have a very, very, you know, um, what do you call a, a, a tropical climate where um, all you need to worry about is humidity and, 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 and heat. So as long as you can take care of the humidity and heat, you're good. So architecture quite often only needs four columns and a roof and to keep yourself above the water level. And that's it. So you are long plinth and that's it. 
This is the first architecture that we had in, in Bangladesh as a modern, tropical modern uh, architecture by Mazhar al-Islam, um, uh, the first architect of Bangladesh. And in a very Corbusian way, as you can see, but it's also lifted above and then a very open, blurring the, blurring the edges of the in and out. So many of our projects also have done, especially in the cities, where we have tried to blur the edges and created this uh, kind of a um, open space. Um, one thing is quite important for us to make sure that your building breathes, which means that there is an airflow, constant airflow, that you can keep your rooms and the, and the buildings as, um, as much uh, cool as possible during the summer months and during winter months as much as, as warm as possible. Uh, winter is not really winter. You should be laughing if I say winter. <laughs> it's about 16, 17. The lo lowest would be 10 degrees, um, but it doesn't get any, any, any less uh, than that generally. Uh, so, but with climate change, who knows? Um, so basically, uh, many of our projects uh, address this issue of how you can make your building breathe. So trying to open it up as much as possible so that you can have airflow. So, you know, this is a very regular um, apartment building, a 12 story building where we have tried to open the edges so that airflow can happen um, to make it breathe at the same time. So that's on a, on a major spine of the city of Dhaka. And, and so that's, a, that's one of the developer buildings, the only developer building that we have ever built. Uh, so we have some of these houses. The, basically, the idea is how can you shade and you know, when you're using glass to shade it so that you don't take in the heat um, because heat is not desirable and at the same time, um, but allow uh, airflow to happen. So these are some of our projects that we have built in the city of Dhaka. Uh, we try to use the stack effect by creating these um, large volume, like in this courtyard, as you can see here. Am I blocking? <laughs> no? <laughs> okay. So you can see this court, which is like a high volume, and it really allows um, the airflow to happen. So to creating airflow is something very, very important. So this is, again, another project where we try to create this long shaft, which would allow the air to come in, and then having a, a kind of a... Um, uh, long verandas that we used to have in our old architecture, pre-air conditioning era, we had something called long veranda, which we used to be a buffer um, between the in and out so that it can condition the air before it entered. So we tried to use that long veranda kind of a technique um, to use it. So you can see here um, of that veranda-like space and at the same time, um, so that gives us a certain kind of a shading and also allows the air to be modulated before it enters into the building. The idea was that it can also be a place where you can have some vegetation. Um, and so this atrium in the center, again, another building, this is, a, this is a, 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 an embassy that we designed, um, the French-German embassy. Uh, we won first prize, but then we were not given the job. It was the French architect who built it uh, at the end. But uh, anyway, so, but this was an idea again that even if it's an embassy and you need to have much more high security, you cannot open up windows, but you can also s create these uh, spaces through which you can have um, the openings and all. This is a small project, again, have that same kind of an idea of how you can make your building breathe and, and create that kind of an um, so, so in many of our projects, or most of our projects, this is what we try to do, is address nature, um, yeah, especially in our context, whatever that means is about having local material, uh, addressing the local climate, uh, to make the building as much comfortable as possible using natural means, uh, what we call passive system, um, and uh, without mm, air conditioning, or art artificial means. So that's one of the houses that we built in the, uh, uh, in a coast, in, almost on the periphery of Dhaka. Uh, that's the central atrium, as you can see. And then on the top level, we have these spaces which acts like a pavilion. Um, you, you see that I, I use a lot of brick because that's the only material we have. We don't have any stone. We have earth. It's accumulation of silt and that earth 
either you can build with earth or you can bake it and turn it into brick. And this is one of our Buddhist monasteries. We have many of these Buddhist monasteries and even in those time, in the, in the second century, third century, they also baked earth and turned it into brick and made these uh, beautiful monasteries that we have. We also have these beautiful terracotta temples in our land, uh, which are intricately curved, and you can see all the, all the depiction of Ramayana, Ramayana and Mahabharata on that. So basically, these are also beautiful materials. So brick is, a, is an industry for us. We have constructed with brick the entire city, uh, in many ways have a lot of brick in its use. Um, I'll just go very quickly. I don't know what to do. <laughs> it's almost an hour that I've talked. I don't know how time flies. So that's Dhaka. And Dhaka actually started in the, um, the river Buriganga. And then it has expanded. And it's one of the fastest growing cities in the world. It has about uh, 300 square kilometer of space. Um, and the population is 20 million or more. It's constantly increasing. So 20 million is one of the highest density um, uh, cities in the world. So it's, it's again one of those, and, and a lot of people are internally displaced, as I was showing you, a lot of uh, slum dwellers. We have one of the most beautiful architectural structures in the world. We are very proud of that. Um, and, but at the same time, we also have this condition where the formal and the informal, so-called formal and informal, live side by side. It's a symbiotic relationship. One cannot do without the other. And so basically, that's the city. Um, very densely built, as you can see here, um, uh, and, and because of no decentralization, the entire country has to come to Dhaka at some point for education, for health, for any kind of need, for job opportunities. And so there are very few green areas still left in the entire country, I mean, the entire city. That's the parliament building, as you can see, the Khan's building. And then here's another project that we had done. Uh, so this is our Museum of Independence. This is a project which we uh, designed very early in our life. I mean, uh, just after graduation, there was a competition for the Independence Monument and the Museum of Independence, and we won this project, won the competition, and we actually uh, had the opportunity of building it. Um, and so just to give you an idea, this is a site which used to be a horse racing ground. This is a place where also one of the major speeches took place that actually triggered a war between, uh, between Pak it's, it's a war between East and West Pakistan. And then that's the same ground where also uh, the, after the war, the surrender ceremony happened. So just to give you a background of what, where Bangladesh was born politically, it's the Indian subcontinent getting divided during the, after the end of the British colonial rule, uh, the entire subcontinent was divided into three parts. So India being in the middle, there, were, there was one country, which is Pakistan. And Pakistan was two parts. One is East Pakistan, which is Bangladesh now, and uh, West Pakistan, which is now Pakistan. And uh, this was done based on religious belief. So the Muslim majority areas turned into Pakistan, and the Hindu majority areas became um, India. So, and it was one of the largest forced mass migration that had happened um, in history of the, of the world. And it happened in a very short period of time. My own family, who comes from India, being Muslims, they had to move to Bangladesh. So we were also refugees at one point in time in our life. Um, and so, so they moved from uh, a certain part right here, and they had to move to Dhaka. And, so, and, and this is the only remaining reminiscence of our old heritage that still uh, uh, is there with us. Um, so between 1947 to 1971 was a kind of a struggle because though we were Muslims, uh, we had completely different culture, we talked to different languages. There was always a certain, this, this was not a country to be uh, with a 1,700 uh, miles of uh, area between us. And so uh, at, at one point in 1971, um, uh, um, there was a war between the East Pakistan, mostly army, uh, and the freedom fighters of Bangladesh. And that led 
uh, that nine month long struggle led to uh, sovereign Bangladesh, as you can see here. And in 1997, we had this competition to build a museum commemorating this whole, whole uh, um, history and the narration of Bangladesh. So what we did is we created this plaza in the middle of this park, which is one of the last rare green areas left in, our in, in the city of Dhaka. We didn't want to fill, fill it up with a building. Uh, the idea was to make a museum, and we, so we took the museum below grade, so it's now uh, sitting under the uh, park, and we just created a plaza on top, where, which is more of a celebratory space. So the idea was that freedom, dream, aspiration has a preferred direction, which is upwards, so the plaza was that place where you celebrate. And memory, sadness, loss has, a, has, has an effect which urges the subterranean, so that's why the museum was taken below grade. And on the plaza, we have this water feature, uh, which actually draws into it, and then we have the, uh, we have the uh, independence monument at the end, and then we have a wall that takes you down. So the museum is here, as you can see. There's a central chamber. We have the audiovisual room, the ma museum spaces all around. And, and being lower in the ground, we try to bring in light as much as possible. And so basically, this is, um, to some extent, the ramp taking people down. And the museum is basically showing all the different images uh, printed on glass and, and and the entire history of Bangladesh's birth um, is embedded in this glass. And, and there is this area which is kind of dark and uh, with a, a dark space through which you enter into this uh, oculus of a central chamber where the water from the top is kind of drawn in, uh, creating this um, uh, column of light uh, which has only light coming from the top, which is the daylight. And so it's a space where there is no display, it's just a space for con contemplation and uh, to remember the people who has lost their lives and has had, had gone through the struggle to give Bangladesh its uh, uh, birth. So that's the space and then you slowly, we go up um, and then we face the, the Tower of Independence. The Tower of Independence, the idea was that it's a tower of light and so we use glass as a material, so there's a space frame structure, and then the glass are not, uh, not uh, pane glasses, it's just stacks of glass. So the stack glass actually creates um, a kind of a prismatic effect because they're stacked together and then cladded onto the uh, space frame structure. And so uh, during the daytime, it's more or less a normal somber look, but then during the evening times, we lit it from outside and as you lit it, it becomes a tower of light in the evening. So it's a sort of a beacon of hope for a young nation. Um, and so that was a project. I will finish it very quickly <laughs> with my mosque project <laughs> because I, <laughs> uh, I just don't want to uh, bore people with architecture. <laughs> um, so, uh, so this is Dhaka, as I was showing you. The blue dot up there is the mosque uh, that um, was kind of acclaimed in many um, with awards and whatnot, um, which has brought a lot of international attention. Uh, but it had a very humble beginning. It was a, it's a site which is to the northern part of Dhaka, which was not even part of Dhaka when we started the project in 2000 and, um, uh, 2005. Uh, but then the city, as it grows, as fast as it grows, it slowly was taken over. The agrarian land was taken over by settlements. And um, my grandmother, here you can see her. She's the one who actually commissioned me for this project. So she had some land in that area. And uh, her idea was that there is no mosque. Uh, why, don't you, why don't we build a mosque? So she, it was a really serious commission that she actually invited me and, and told me that I want you to design and build it. And so this is the first prayer that happened under the jackfruit tree because there was nothing. And you can see that it's a very village-like atmosphere even then. And so I started with this mosque project. Again, um, I do not have much uh, knowledge of going to a mosque because in South Asia, we don't have women going to mosques. So I had no knowledge of, um, I mean, of course I knew what mosques are like, but no ex personal experience of going to a mosque. 
Um, and so basically I started, I think that in a way liberated my uh, thought process and I, I, and I approached it as an architect. So the idea was to find out what is a mosque. And if you look into the very history of uh, the, mo the genesis or the uh, creation of mosque, it's actually the prophet who, uh, who initiated this idea. And uh, it was taken from a house form where people would be able to come and congregate where they would discuss about the religion and the religious belief, not just only for prayer, but for also other different kind of um, important issues, uh, which are communal, social, which is also about judiciary, administrative, um, diplomatic. So it's, it was a space, a large space, which was elongated by taking a house form and, and, and this space was created. And as you know that Muslims all around the world praise around the Kibla, Kaaba. So the Kaaba and so the Canadians would pray towards southeast, whereas Bangladeshis pray, pray towards east. South, yeah, southwest. No, we, we pray towards west and you pray towards southeast. <laughs> so it's a, it's a kind of a, the entire world is revolving around this. Uh, so, um, so these are certain, of course, uh, interesting uh, points. And then if you look into the history of uh, mosque, uh, you'll see that as Islam flourished and went to the east and the west of the Arabian Peninsula, it has taken many different forms and shapes. Uh, so you see all kinds of mosques. So it just adapted to the local culture, the local technique of construction, local material, climate, and, and there is all these varied forms uh, that you can find. And in our own location, we had this uh, mosque form, which is um, from the Sultanate period uh, in the 14th century. This is when Islam first came to Bengal. And so these are the ha mosques that you can find in that location. And these are beautiful mosque forms, I think, uh, in its authentic um, uh, space. And then also this, the idea of uh, spirituality or the idea of, of light and how one connects with the divine because you know, when you go to a mosque to pray or to any religious institution, it's about internalizing, it's about your connection to the God and to the divine. So basically that spiritual feeling is something that, is, uh, that needed to be addressed. So that's something also, again, those two spaces to me are the most profound spaces uh, in terms of spiritual uh, connection. So that's the side. And uh, as I was showing that the, yeah, because of the direction of the Mecca, I had to shift the entire uh, prayer hall to a certain direction. So the site gave me a, a kind of a rectangle, a squarish shape, which is about 75 feet by 75 feet. And then, um, yeah, but the prayer hall needed to be shifted to about 13 degrees. So I shifted that, but then it created this crazy corner. So I introduced a drum in the middle to, to facilitate that uh, shift. And so um, that's a kind of a process that went on. And then um, the project, um, as it, so it kind of also takes reference from the old architecture. And so this was my first conceptual drawing where I created this uh, brick uh, kind of a wrapping around the prayer hall. Uh, so in, in a computer generated image. So that's the main prayer hall in the middle and then you have the brick structure surrounding it. The idea was that we, uh, the, the project was a very low budget project. Uh, there was hardly any, uh, the entire project was finished in $150,000. Uh, so $150,000 was not a lot of money. Um, so basically um, uh, the, uh, the side part um, or the wrapping we created with brick and there's no concrete in it. So if you do not build with concrete, then the cost goes really low. Uh, so we decided not to use concrete at all. So the entire structure is load bearing on the edges, uh, brick load bearing structure, and the central space is only column free and has concrete in it. Um, so here is the plan, as you can see, that's the ground floor plan. So uh, the walls became thicker, but the walls also became this, uh, the generator of spaces so we have stair that goes up, there's the ablution area down there, people come in from that side, so those are the steps, um, and that's a colonnade, so through there generally people come in. And as I was mentioning that it needs to be porous to be able to breathe, so the building needed to breathe and, and that's why we created a 
kind of a, a very porous wall. So this is in its own location. As you can see, it's a growing neighborhood, a lot of settlements surrounding the mosque. So at one point, you will not be able to see anything because all these plots are already being uh, built. So at one point, there will, the mosque will not be seen, perhaps. So it was important to internalize rather than to look outside. Um, so that's the space, and you can already see the new buildings coming up. Um, so that's uh, from the, so this is a very low income neighborhood. Um, people around um, the community actually participated when we were um, building this project. So uh, my grandmother, she did leave some money and then she passed away the same year she commissioned me. And so it became a responsibility for me to finish the project. Uh, so I became the architect, the fundraiser, the builder, the client, everything in one. And so, so I had to keep it within budget and the community participated in, uh, in also uh, giving us the funding. Uh, so these are some of the spaces and as you can see from the brick wall, then you go into the prayer hall. So that's the prayer hall um, um, which has a different kind of a light uh, structure than what you see outside. So uh, these are open to sky courts where we allow rain to come in, the nature to come in. So basically there's a lot of play of light um, since I didn't have any budget to embellish it with lots of decoration. I use light as a decoration. So uh, it's quite often uh, this, when you see this light um, coming in and as the sun moves the light the structure also moves and throughout the season, different season, it has different way of uh, the light plays its own uh, game in a way. North November is a completely different than what you see in June, let's say, so it's quite interesting. So no two visits will be similar. Uh, that's one of the courtyards uh, where um, the, the toilets block is located. So basically that's the mosque architecture. I've already taken a lot of time. I'm not going to take any more. I think it would be nice to have a discussion. Um, there's just a small mosque we just finished. And this is my second mosque, by the way. So this is in a village, uh, which is right next to a house. It's, it's an old house, about 200 year old, and someone, uh, one of the architects um, who restored it. And he, he wanted me to come and design a mosque. Um, and so that's basically the site, actually. So that's the house and that's the mosque that we have built. Uh, so it's, an, it's, a, it's a family who are dispersed all around the world. And the entire family actually pays for the upkeep of the building and they quite often go there. So that house belongs to them. So this is the mosque we uh, designed. And, um, and there's this pond some, uh, in the front and the, build, and the entire house is actually bounded by a boundary wall which is a common way of doing things. And the mosque is quite often right outside the boundary. And so here again, we did a load bearing structure. And as you can see, uh, there's no column in between. The entire thing is made out of brick. Uh, so brick wall, and we created the apertures in a way so that it allows uh, airflow and it also allows light, but at the same time keeps it shaded so that it can survive without having any kind of air conditioning or any sort of um, maintenance free building. So from the inside of the courtyard, that's the mosque. I'll just go very quickly and I'll finish it. So that's uh, after we finished it. Now this is what it looks like. We uh, used basically a very polished floor uh, so that it gives a kind of a reflection and, and, and makes it a larger than what the space is actually. So. So you can see that it's all open all around. And so it's just a space where people can come in and pray, but it can also be used for other things. Um, yeah, so I will finish it here. Thank you so much for your patience and listening to me. Thank you. Let's just leave it there. It's not so bad. Beautiful image. Do we have mics around for audience? So um, thank you so much, Marina, for it's always 
it, it's um, a few times since I see you present a number of these projects. The refugee camps is, is, is new, but each time I'm very moved by it. And I, I'm sure everyone in this room has been moved by the, uh, so it's a sustained body of work in which the perhaps the typology and material changes, but the, the intentionalities between the architecture, the sensitivity to local materials, local climate, economies, and people right. are persistent uh, and consistent throughout, which is very, very inspirational. I'm very glad that you've been able to share these very personal and professional works with us. Thank, Thank you, you again. Thank you. So um, because of time, I will actually ask if there are questions from, from the audience. So whether it's students, faculty members, architects, or um, just our general community members, uh, please, if you have questions for Marina, please you raise your hand. I think there, there are mics around. So go ahead and if I see any. Um, Okay, there, there's one mic or two mic? Okay. All right, if you could just say your name. Uh, yeah, hi, and then I'm New Bross um, I'm here to listen to Marina Appa, and I'm glad I'm here. Uh, it was a great experience, uh, beautiful lecture and images, and uh, learned a lot. I have three questions, and it's up to you whether you want to answer all three. <laughs> um, I was intrigued, that's why uh, I have so many questions. One is, Bangladesh is a country of 170 million people. Space is a huge problem. So the internal migration usually happens for the, this push and pull factor, climatic factor, right? So the houses you're building, is that a challenge for you? Rather than, it's a, is it a, the space a challenge for you? or the architecture, because already the slum dwellers have their makeshift ad hoc houses. So how do you think your ones is, is different and contribute? Secondly, we have this whole cyclone thing going on. We, we are known to be a country of floods and cyclone. So do you have that structural ability to do that, um, that, that, that module houses? And th my third question is about the Baitul uh, Rof Mosque. Uh, and you showed a number of mosque images, the genealogy. And I was wondering uh, if it's becoming a dense area. The minaret has been very symbolic of mosque. So how did you address that? Was it in your mind? Was it intentional to get rid of it? So these are the three questions. Uh, but thank you for the wonderful lecture. I think she's going to take like half an hour, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no more questions needed. Oh, well, the first question is uh, whether this is addressing the, uh, the density. Well, this project, I mean, especially the Kudibari that we have uh, designed, is actually focusing on the marginalized people who are living in geographically and climatically challenged locations in Bangladesh. This is not intended for the cities, let's say. So when it's a, uh, and, and as you know that in Bangladesh there are many geographical conditions, and especially the coastal areas, as I was saying, that there are a lot of people living in these, uh, in these sand beds, and sand beds quite often uh, is vanishing. So it's a, it's a moving, moving land, not really a land, but it's a moving phenomena. And so they need to move. And so our priority was actually how you can facilitate, facilitate that movement, but at the same time give people a dignified way of living. Yeah, so that's what we were trying to address. And, and we tried this same structure, as I was saying, that we have these 100 houses that we need to build in different locations in Bangladesh. We're also trying out in different locations, like where we have flash flooding, especially in this case of um, the wetlands of Tangor Haur, where um, you know, the water comes um, and then floods the, the wetlands. Uh, and, and flooding is a major issue. And since it has these two levels, we were just trying to see whether this is something that could benefit them. And what it seems is does benefit them. We've also built a houses, I mean, this is just a house, but this is a scalable structure, which we are now building as a school you know, for the uh, river nomad community, the Bede community, who are river nomads, who've been moving uh, from river to river uh, for ages. They're like indigenous uh, to, the, to Bangladesh. 
So these river nomads um, need schools wherever they, they, they go and settle on, the, on land maybe for a few, few weeks or so. So there are some, and the way, the, way, the way we work, it's not actually me going somewhere or we going somewhere and addressing a certain group. We uh, try to partner with NGOs, we try to partner with people who are already working with them. It could be livelihood program, it could be um, you know, different kind of programs that are already existing. So then that makes, us, makes it easier, facilitates us to make that connection with people. So that's why it's important for us to have partner NGOs or partner humanitarian or you know, any other agencies who are working there. Uh, so that's how we've been doing. So it's a geographically, climatically, challenge location where we are building it. What was your second question? <laughs> oh yeah, it, it is not cyclone proof. Nothing is cyclone proof. The kind of cyclone we get, it, it wouldn't survive a cyclone. But definitely thunderstorm, we have had a few and it was able to resist the thunderstorms. But cyclones, you need, we need proper cyclone shelter for that. And so this wouldn't really resist cyclone, cyclonic uh, wind. Um, um, but, um, but thunderstorms, yes. You asked about the mosque, um, whether why, why didn't I address the issue of minaret? Um, you know, minarets were there for a certain reason. I mean, you've seen the buildings surrounding it. So there are eight story, 12 story buildings. How high do you want your minaret to be <laughs> to, to, for people to be able to see it? And whether it's at all necessary to invest that amount of money just for the sake of symbolic value to have a minaret, which would then, you know, as I said, it's a low budget project. I had to make the best use of the fund that I had. And so min making minaret was not one of our, one of the priorities. And it's, it was needed for a certain reason that was, you know, you needed when you had to call for prayer uh, to a larger area and there was no uh, electronic system or technology to, to send your voice far for people to come and pray. That was the reason why we had minarets. But in, in our time, when there is so much of technology, you've seen a building right behind the mosque, which acts as the minaret actually. So we have the main um, microphone on top of it. So that acts as the minaret. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I do want to go back to the first question that was asked. I thought it was a really interesting one, which part of the question was how are these 100 houses or the refugee housings different from the slum housing that the communities that uh, they, they already built. Right. And from what you have presented to us is that while the typology of these raised housing on stilts was once a traditional and prevalent form of housing, what has happened throughout Asia and Southeast Asia is that those housing in contemporary times that are no longer being built or being used so right. that they, most of the slum housing are the, the, the brick structure or, or cement block structure that is still sitting right. on the ground. And it was notable when you said that during the last flooding yeah. that the, the, the houses that you have been able yeah. to provide allow the families to be able to survive exactly. the flood, et cetera. Yeah. I also think in turn, I, I what I find interesting about the work that you're doing is that not only is it different from the slum housing that the communities themselves are building, I think it's also interesting to talk about how is it different from the conventional social housing that architects have been designing and building for a century, right? So it appears that it is not about building a, a center of refugee housing where we're asking everyone to move to there. You are, what I found remarkable about the project is that you are a traveling architect, kind of like the traveling doctor. Mm -hmm. yeah? You are meeting mm -hmm. where the local residents are, at right. where the homes are. It's yes. where they want to be, Absolutely. it's where they feel safe, and in fact, it's the only places they're allowed to be. That's true. And I find that to be from kind of the perspective of, uh, the longer perspective history of how architects um, as a profession have been trying to contribute towards social housing. Right, yeah. This is yeah, something I that is absolutely a radical departure yeah. in imposition, attitude, yeah. and methodology. Yeah, that's true. I think you made a very good point. 
Why, why didn't I think of that? Right. Uh, the thing is, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that was actually something we had in mind that, you know, people move away. Displacement is about going to the city because they have no other means. Um, and so uh, it's, it, even with a few of the projects that I haven't really shown, which is also, again, we built this resort in the southern part of Bangladesh where we tried to employ people locally, uh, trying to create jobs so that they don't need to move to the city because moving to the city is not an option really. It just doesn't give them the right kind of dignified way of living a life. And so if you can keep people in their own location, give them the pride of staying in their own location, give them a proper living environment, also giving them livelihood. That's the reason why people move. So creating job, creating livelihood, giving them proper education, health facility, if those things can be ensured, people would not move to the cities really. And so, yeah, so basically that was also, again, another um, major thing that we thought about. Yeah, so in, in this case, I think you, you mentioned in passing of the city being essentially a combination of the informal and formal processes, and traditionally architects have worked with the formal aspects, Absolutely. whether it's policy, government, et cetera. Yeah. So I, I think you are one of the architects in which I think we have recognized that they, we need to be working with both the formal and, and informal in right. order to kind of break right. through the, the boundary. Yeah, and as I was mentioning about the community architects, we have you know, fantastic community architects who are working in the slum areas in yeah, the city also. That's great. Yeah, and they have addressed the slum dwelling um, where you know, there's no ownership of land, so you cannot really go and build something there. So they have created a lot of interesting ways of how one can, uh, you know, like a com as a community, as a cooperative, they buy a small parcel of land outside of the city and they actually help them to create that community in, in designing, working with them together. Uh, they've created this funding where the cooperative actually creates a fund with which they can, um, they're able to then uh, make these houses. So there are a lot of interesting models that are being tested and tried by architects. So architects are working as agents of change. And I think in our 21st century, uh, that would be a major shift in the profession where um, architecture will not just be a service rendering profession where you have a client coming to you and wanting to build something. But as a profession, we have to reach out to people and create projects, fund, find ways of funding and make uh, these architecture which is beneficial to people, actually, who are not uh, you know, in our clientele group. So that 99% that of the people needs our attention. As a profession, we should be doing something about it. I absolutely agree. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Um, Uh, those of you below probably see the order in which hands were raised, so you could. Yes, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I came in here tonight thinking, my first question was, how did a woman end up designing a mosque in Bangladesh? Which you answered in your presentation, so I'm not gonna go <laughs> deep into it. So, but my question is, does your mosque have a designated space for females or are you able to introduce that concept in Bangladeshi society? Because as a Bangladeshi, I, like as you mentioned, the mosque is usually restricted for female and can we use architecture or is it something that can you, you use to introduce to your mosque, say a space for females or what can you say about Yeah, that? well, sure, why not? I mean, we do have a space on the upper floor, uh, so you can take the stair and go and use the upper floor if ever a woman would want to pray, but in that area, there is no culture of women going to mosque. But that would not be something I would want to do. I mean, as a woman, if you want me to come to a mosque, I want to pray in the main prayer space, which is generally not allowed. I'm not allowed to stand right behind, um, you know, the the imam, let's say, and to pray. So my, I have a, I have a theory, <laughs> or I have a, I have a remedy for that. But why can't we have two prayers, one for men and one for women, in the same space? If you, if it is so difficult for women to be in the same prayer space as men, let's say, 
why can't we have two prayers, one for women and one for women? And we have a certain amount of time uh, between two prayers, right? So there, there is enormous amount of time between the two. So then, you know, it could be the women coming and doing their prayer first, going out, men coming and doing it, or it could be the other way around. I don't mind that. But the fact is, why aren't we thinking about that? Why do we have to have a separate space for women? That's my question to you. Let us begin by having a space, like right now. There are there spaces. There are spaces in many mosques, especially in the larger mosques. This is a small mosque. There are many mosques um, in the city of Dhaka where they have. But then women have to go through a back door, going into a certain space, like a, like, you know, okay, reasonably big space. But they're not connected to the main congregation. So then, you know, why would I go and pray? In, I can pray in my home and in a much better uh, situation. Why would I go to the mosque and pray if you're not letting me be a part of the congregation? Yes, uh, it, it's, it's a fantastic point and question. Yeah, as a, as a woman, as women <laughs> builders, we can design and build the structures uh, yet at times, we're not allowed, not allowed to, to enter. <laughs> enter and pray. Um, right. I have been to, as an architectural tourist, to mosques from Xi'an to Istanbul, and each time with students and uh, you know uh, women and men students, and it, it's always a question that we discuss. And I hope as um, barring from the sentence you were saying, Marina, of architects as agents of change. Mm -hmm. I hope we can change not only some of these um, architectural and spatial practices, but hopefully one day cultural and religious practices as well. Yeah. Okay, Absolutely. thank you. Other question? There's a hand raised in the back. Yeah, I have Hi. my... Um, Hi. Oh, okay. yeah. Go ahead. My name is Kavita. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It uh, evoked a lot of emotions. <laughs> um, so uh, there is a very uh, strong sense of informality in your uh, designs, uh, which renders the sense of transient nature of that architecture. That's why it's, uh, it's easier to envision a khudibari as an added layer in the urban streets also. But uh, here in Canada, it's the opposite. Everything is uh, very formal. It's rigid, clean. Um, even an indigenous tribe that wants to uh, build using wood from their own land have to get it tested, stamped, approved. A lot of red taping there. Um, so can you suggest how? Uh, can you suggest some sort of a negotiation which we can bring, like some sort of a flexibility uh, a little bit of informality while we, while we make architecture, while we practice architecture in a Canadian context, like how can we make it a little more tangible here? Thank you. <laughs> I think the Canadians should be answering that, not me, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm doing my context, you know, and I, we have our own issues and problems. And we also have a quite formal, rigid architecture, and I think I've showed you quite a lot of very rigid uh, buildings too. Um, but yeah, I, I do understand your question, the fact that things are becoming much more bureaucratic, much more um, sanitized in many ways. We, our comfort levels are becoming so much more um, you know, um, t intolerable. So that tolerance is also becoming difficult. The, the, this, the issues of security, issues of um, comfort. So those are, you know, turning things into such a way that architects are going through regulation before they even draw a line. Um, and, and, you know, I, I don't know how to address that. Those are not just in Canada, it's in most of the US, uh, you know, Western countries are facing that Europe is also kind of gridlocked in all these systems too. Um, we wanted to build a Kudibari in the, in the Royal Academy. Our architects were ready to go and build it. They wouldn't allow us because we don't have indemnity insurance. What if they fall and break their leg? Who's gonna take care of that? So, you know, and they're building in the most difficult of locations. 
Um, and you know, it, this is not an issue for us at all, but then we're not allowed to even, and they would not even allow people to go up to the upper deck um, just in case if someone falls and sues and all that stuff. So, so you know, I mean, I understand the problem. It's not architecture, <laughs> it's something else. Uh, so, so, but I don't have your answer, sorry, really. It, it has to, the Canadian architects have to solve this. Um, if I if I could, I I think perhaps one is underestimating the challenges, the formal challenges that architects like Marina and others are building in in other parts outside of North America. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's true that it's necessarily easier to be informal or flexible in other parts. Um, you know, I. I think a conversation could be had with many um, ar architects in, in Asia, in others who, who could really talk about the challenges. We could really talk about ch the challenges of, at times, even more rigid um, economic, yeah. logistical, yeah. and especially political systems. Right. Um, so the situations are different, the economies are different. I, would, I, I hope you're a student of the school. I hope you hold that question and really see how you can create a research and design project around it. And very much what architects are doing, like Marina, is um, they are looking for gray areas. They're looking for spaces in between. And it's not just physical spaces, but legal spaces, temporal spaces. What is interesting about the work of architecture right. uh, transition is not only designing with space, but also designing with time. So those houses exist in between floods, right. in between environmental disasters. They only exist sometimes for a week at a time, yeah. sometimes for a month at a time. So if we think about in a North American context, to be inventive, to be creative, to be designing with, in some ways, the loopholes and the gray zones that is in between what is needed and what our current rules and regulations perceive as what's needed. And I think it's up to all of you to search for those and to be as inventive and in, in many ways as courageous right. as what uh, Marina's work are showing. Yeah, you know, when we work in the refugee camp, the restrictions are very high, as I said, that they, they, they won't allow a foundation more than two feet deep. The two feet is your maximum foundation that you can build. <laughs> what can you do with the two feet foundation? But you have to create architecture out of that. And they have restrictions about materials, restrictions, a lot of restrictions. So then, you know, that's again another kind of restriction. It may not be as similar as yours, but we have tried to find ways of not look, you know, architecture that doesn't look beautiful, uh, but at the same time serves the purpose. You've seen a few un ugly buildings. And so basically, you know, the thing is, um, you have to work around the system also at times to, to find uh, ways which is. The, uh, the ultimate focus is giving people the right kind of space that they deserve. And how you do it um, around that is something you have to innovate, I think. Okay. I think we have time for one last question. You might have to battle for it. Um, I see Peter's been raising your hand quite a bit, so we'll give you a chance if you want to stand up. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> no, no. Then, then, um, or, or you've demonstrated the richness of a great tradition in, in Bangladesh. But you also spoke of a reverence for Louis Kahn and for the, the parliament building. And I wonder if you could say just a couple of words about what, again, as someone working in such a rich tradition, that building has meant to you and, and, and to, to architecture in Bangladesh. I mean, you know, the building is, a, is an enormously powerful building which is sitting there in the middle of the city. And uh, we are constantly reminded of the, of the, of the, of the, of the architecture. I mean, I, I personally have, have seen that building growing up from, from a baby to its final growth. Um, and so basically um, when it was finished, my first time I went in there was when I was in high school. 
And even not being in architecture, that building had a profound effect, um, especially the way light um, creates uh, the magic, especially in the ambulatory space between the main building and all these eight buildings that surrounding it. And it's connected by this ambulatory space, which is a fascinating space. It's like a city within a building. Uh, you have this uh, nice uh, kind of a street-like atmosphere when, when Khan talks about a street is a room by agreement. To some extent, I feel like that's also a kind of that. Um, and, and as an architecture student, I've been inside that building several times with professors by ourselves going through measuring and whatnot. It kind of grows on you. It, you definitely, you know, when you see a good piece of architecture, you, you absorb it in many ways, not just the building, but also the spaces, everything. And it's not just only Khan's building, it's also all the buildings that, that really uh, resonates with you. The good, good architecture that really has that ability to connect with people. You sort of, you know, in a way you, you embody them. And then when you create something, at times they just come out with your hand, but it's not Khan anymore, it's you. <laughs> so that's how I would like to say it. So I would say that I've been inspired by Khan's uh, work, definitely, mostly his, uh, his lectures, I mean, his, his talks that he has given, they're just so profound. I mean, there's so much to learn from whatever he has talked about. I mean, till date, whenever if I find a chance, I always listen to his talks more than, uh, his buildings are, you know, you cannot recreate them, but you can be inspired by the words he has said, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the influence of Khan in Southeast Asia as Corbusier in India, Satish Chandigar, it, it itself warrant another one hour, two hour discussion. Oh yeah, absolutely. But right. um, what, you know, what is interesting of uh, whether it's Khan's work um, in Dhaka or many of the, the buildings by Corb in Chandigarh, they in many ways have adopted their architecture and their way of thinking to the local climate and context. And yes. most of the, those buildings are not mechanically heated or cooled. Uh, solar shading, sun shading, the relationship between the building and the street are much more pronounced in their works in Southeast Asia than in the European context. Mm -hmm. So I do think there are many lessons for us to yeah. still learn from these precedents in how architecture can sensitively adopt to local context and materials and, and cultures. Absolutely, so true. Thank, yeah. you, thank you so much, uh, Marina, for, for all of this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so before, sorry, before we uh, move to the next door for a very simple, hopefully, but friendly reception for everyone. I would like to invite uh, Jason Yuen, our chair of Daniel's Faculty Public Programming, to who have helped to organize all of this for some closing remarks. assistant professor in architecture here at the Daniels faculty, as well as the chair of the public programming committee. As the dean noted, tonight's Gary, um, Gary chair lecture was the first event of the faculty's fall 2022 public programming series, which runs until November 29th. Our public programming this, this semester is designed to foster a meaningful dialogue on the important social, political, and environmental challenges confronting our world today. Um, and this term, it includes a fascinating series of lectures, book talks, panel discussions, and symposia. They address a range of topics, which we began tonight with a really fabulous one, um, and a range of other topics that are central to what we do here at the Daniels faculty, including questions of design and social justice, art and new media, urbanism and housing, and ecology and landscape resilience, among others. As in previous years, all the events are open to the public and are free of charge to attend, so I encourage you all to attend as many as you can. Um, the next event in the series, uh, which is an artist talk from Montreal, new, based, uh, new, media art, uh, new media artist and composer, Aaron G, excuse me, and it'll take place on Tuesday, September 27th at 6.30 p.m. right here in Main Hall. 
um, of the Daniels Building and will be moderated by our own Micho Akiyama. So I hope to see you all again there. Um, now, I would like to um, invite you all to join us for some refreshments in the student commons just here in the north doors. Um, and thank you all again for coming. <laughs>